thank you so much for inviting me and having me here. I'm really excited to speak to everybody about deoxygenation. We need oxygen in the marine environment for the same reason we need oxygen on land. It's basically to support the wide range of organisms and animals that are on Earth. So most marine organisms do require oxygen, and this ranges anywhere from crustaceans like shrimp and lobsters um, to other invertebrates like cephalopods, squid and octopus and cuttlefish, and a wide variety of fish like the swordfish and tuna I've shown here, um, and um, of course other vertebrates and marine invertebrates in, in the ocean. Um, so I would like to mention that air breathing um, animals in the ocean like dolphins or turtles, they also require oxygen, um, but they're gonna be less of a topic today just because they rely on oxygen that's found in the atmosphere instead of in the water. Um, so one thing I'd like to point out for marine, ox for marine organisms, um, Breathing in water is a little bit more challenging than, um, than it is on land. So in water, there's about 30%, um, 30 times more uh, less oxygen in water as compared to in air. Water is denser and more viscous, which just means that oxygen extraction um, from a kind of water medium is a little bit more challenging. So marine organisms must process a lot more water to receive an equivalent amount of oxygen as compared to an air. So for example, an air breather has to process about 3.6 liters of um, air to just extract one gram of oxygen. In contrast, someone in the marine environment has to process about 152 liters of, of water just to extract that same one gram of um, oxygen. So um, within these challenges, um, we also see um, in addition to just physiological differences in how they extract oxygen from the environment, um, we in the ocean, we see a much more variable oxygen environment than in the air. So for example, um, if a human were to start off at sea level and then climb all the way up to the top of Mount Everest, which is at about 9,000 meters altitude, there would be about 30% of the oxygen um, at the top of Mount Everest um, compared to at sea level. Um, in contrast, a marine organism, um, if they were to swim from the surface down to 650 meters depth on the ocean off of California, there would only be about 2.75% of the oxygen content that they would experience at the surface. Um, so one thing I'd like to point out about this figure um, um, where you can see kind of the, the change in air oxygen content in the black line and then the change in water oxygen content in this yellow line here um, is that these axes for the atmosphere and air and um, also uh, with depth underwater are an order of magnitude difference. So you're seeing up to 10,000 meters depth in the air, or, I'm sorry, altitude in the air and then down only to about 1,000 meters depth in the ocean. So you see a much greater change in oxygen over a much shorter distance um, in the ocean. Okay, so in addition um, to oxygen changing with depth, I want to point out that across the globe, there is a lot of extra spatial variability. Um, and so on the left, you can see oxygen profiles. Um, and so when we talk about oxygen profiles, I'm primarily um, going to talk about plots that have um, depth on the y-axis descending, and then um, oxygen on the x-axis. Um, in this case, it's increasing towards the right. So oxygen, we know, changes with depth. We just talked about that in the last slide. Um, but I'd like to point out that um, oxygen has a lot of spatial variability, um, for example, on the surface of the ocean. Um, so this figure on the right is showing the global surface oxygen content um, with these color scales and um, throughout this talk, I'd like just like to say that uh, the absolute values of oxygen that I'm talking about, um, as well as the units of oxygen, might change and they might be a little bit different. They're not super important. What I'd like you to focus on is when there's higher oxygen and when there's lower oxygen. So here with this color scale, warmer colors indicate higher oxygen values and cooler colors indicate lower oxygen values. So you can see with this map that there's a very large um, spatial difference in oxygen with uh, less oxygen being found at the surface in the tropical areas as compared to the poles.
And this variability continues as we descend deeper in the ocean. So now I'm showing you um, a figure of oxygen at 300 meters depth across the world. And you can see that there are these large areas that have very low oxygen. Um, in this case, the color scale is actually reversed. And so low oxygen are show is shown in these warmer colors and higher oxygen values are shown in cooler colors. So you can see very large differences across the globe in areas where there are um, higher oxygen values at depth. Um, for example, in Antarctica, um, in Hawaii, and also the Gulf of Mexico, as compared to areas where oxygen gets very low in the midwater, such as the California current, where we are now, um, shown in blue, and uh, the Gulf of California off of Mexico in black. In addition to spatial variability, oxygen changes over daily, weekly, seasonal, interannual, so over multiple years, and also decadal, so on the order of 10 to 30 year timescales. Um, and so this is an example of extreme oxygen change in the Chesapeake Bay on the east coast of the United States. Um, and this figure, oxygen is again, low oxygen is again shown in these warm colors and high oxygen values are seen in these cooler colors. Um, and so um, what you're seeing in this figure is the difference um, between oxygen values in July of 2011 and July of 2014 in the Chesapeake Bay. And so within a period of only three years, um, you you basically see that there is um, the Chesapeake Bay recorded um, essentially the lowest oxygen values that um, and the highest volume of low oxygen water in the Chesapeake Bay and also um, the highest, the lowest volume of low oxygen water in the Chesapeake Bay. And this difference was seen over only three years. Okay, so oxygen variability isn't inherently bad though, because these this variability in these um, environmental variables and gradients in the ocean provide structure. So normally when you think about going out to the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you think of big blue ocean as far as the eye can see and not much structure being there. So for marine organisms, they rely on um, kind of these environmental variables to provide structure. So what are some examples of those? So um, you see here in this figure, change in irradiance, which is shown in orange, a change in oxygen, which is shown in blue, and then um, a change in temperature, which is shown here in red. So even over the first 600 meters depth, you see this massive change in, in all of these environmental conditions um, that these marine organisms are exposed to. And so marine organisms can then kind of orient themselves in the ocean according to kind of the ranges of sensitivity they have for each of these conditions. Um, and so um, one way that animals orient themselves in the ocean is called diel vertical migration. Um, and diel vertical migration is when thousands and thousands of tiny animals are swimming hundreds of meters per day. So these animals reside deeper in the water column during the daytime, primarily to avoid visual predation. And then at night, they ascend up to the surface and they are able to feed without threat of visual predators um, getting them. And then when um, the dawn happens, they descend back into the water column. So um, the extent of this migration is known to depend on kind of these environmental conditions that I talked about previously, and also um, other factors like the size of the organism. And we know that for most animals, light is the vertical migration cue. Um, and so, Oxygen variability and oxi so oxygen temporal variability and spatial variability isn't an inherently bad thing in the ocean normally. So I just mentioned kind of some of the natural and spatial variability that oxygen has in the ocean, um, but you're absolutely correct. Oxygen has actually been changing on a much larger scale um, in the ocean um, as a result of climate change. Um, and this is just one of kind of a trifecta of challenges that the ocean is experiencing with climate change. Um, when I'm talking about climate change, really what I'm discussing is the great increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide um, that we've seen over you know, the last 100 years. And this has primarily been because of fossil fuel combustion, um, agriculture, and other anthropogenic factors. And so we see this massive increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that plays a role in kind of the changes that we've been seeing in the ocean. And so kind of the first change that we've been observing 
is uh, warming. And so this is a really big deal for the ocean because the ocean is actually absorbing 93% of all of the heat um, from the warming atmosphere. So this is a very, very important problem for the ocean. Um, in addition, the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere is changing the pH of the ocean. So the ocean is becoming more acidic. And ocean acidification is a problem for things like coral reefs or for marine organisms that rely on calcium carbonate for their shells or body structures. So kind of the third middle child, um, forgotten middle child of this, these um, challenges of climate change challenges for the ocean is ocean deoxygenation. Um, it's slightly less talked about. Um, a lot of people have heard about warming and ocean acidification, but very few people have heard about deoxygenation until very recently. So ocean deoxygenation is a very large process of essentially just the loss of oxygen from the ocean. And so over the last 50 years, we've seen about a 2% decline of the ocean oxygen content. And so this figure is showing the change in dissolved oxygen over um, decade changes. And in red is indicating basically oxygen loss from the ocean and um, blue is indicating oxygen gain to the ocean. So you can see that most areas of the ocean are losing oxygen at a pretty fast rate. Um, when we're talking about deoxygenation, um, this can kind of be split into two different facets. So first, um, we can talk about open ocean oxygen loss. So in this figure, that's shown in these blue areas. Um, and so all of the different colors of blue are essentially um, showing different levels of very low oxygen that are found in these areas called oxygen minimum zones in the ocean. In, um, in addition, we also have um, coastal hypoxia and eutrophication happening um, and areas much closer to home for us humans right along our coasts. That's shown in these red dots um, where you can see, um, which are actually areas that have experienced um, low oxygen below a certain threshold. So what are actually the drivers of this oxygen loss um, across the globe? It is variable depending on location, but I'm gonna talk about some of kind of the main drivers that are causing deoxygenation. So the first one is that an increase in temperature in the ocean is decreasing solubility. Um, what does solubility actually mean? It's essentially just the gas holding capacity of the ocean or the water. Um, and the best way to kind of describe this is, um, or and I should say that warmer water holds less gas. And so the best way to describe this is thinking about a can of soda. So if I take a can of soda out of the fridge, I can open it and I might hear a little pss as with, with a small release of gas, but nothing really major is going to happen and I can drink my soda. Um, however, if I leave said can of soda out in my car and it gets really, really warm over a period of two, hour, two hours of time, um, and then I try to go open the soda, what's gonna happen? I'm sure a lot of you in Southern California have experienced this. Um, when the liquid warms up, it's actually going to release all its gas. So not only will your soda be flat, but it's probably gonna kind of splash all over your face when you open the can. Okay, so the other thing that an increased temperature is doing is reducing mixing in the ocean. And so um, scientists call this stratification. So essentially what this means is that you have this warm layer on top of the ocean with cooler water underneath. And it's um, when you have really stratified water, it's really challenging to get good mixing across those ocean layers. Um, and so, but why is that actually a really important thing for oxygen? Um, this is primarily because the only two inputs to oxygen in the ocean are at the surface. And so um, you have air ocean mixing. Um, so you can have wind and waves and diffusion of oxygen across the kind of air ocean barrier. So the surface of the ocean. And then you also have photosynthesis. So you have phytoplankton that are taking carbon dioxide and they're they're, they're releasing oxygen. And so they are able to oxygenate the top surface of the water column where they are. And so phytoplankton can really only reside and photosynthesize in the top layer of the water column because of their light limitation. And so if you have oxygen that's really only being input at the surface, it's a really big problem if you don't have mixing of that oxygen to deeper areas in the water column. 
And so in more coastal areas, one of the main drivers for oxygen loss is from nutrient and organic matter runoff from land. And so this could be um, nutrients from fertilizer, from agriculture, or it could be organic matter like sewage running into the water. Um, and this causes a process called eutrophication. So essentially all of these nutrients um, start running off into the water and phytoplankton um, are able to bloom. And so they can increase in abundance a great amount. And so with this increase of phytoplankton, you do get an increase in oxygen. Um, however, when all of the nutrients are gone, all of that phytoplankton is gonna die. It ends up sinking to the bottom and then you have a massive drawdown of oxygen um, in that area because of all the respiration that's happening and the bacteria, uh, the microbial respiration that's happening. Happening. Um, so one um, example that might be a little close to home with um, eutrophication is harmful algal blooms. So harmful algal blooms are a type of eutrophication um, that can often occur with toxic dinoflagellates. Um, and sometimes they're non-toxic, um, but generally um, they turn the ocean either very green or, you know, lakes or something very green with the, the abundance of algae um, or very red as seen in the photo on the left. Um, and then what happens when there's a massive oxygen drawdown at the end of the bloom after it's decaying is that usually you have this massive die off of fish. Um, and very often they wash up on the beach. Sometimes as the bloom's decaying, you can get a pretty nasty smell. Um, and for those of you who were around in San Diego this spring, we actually had the privilege of seeing one of the largest out, um, red tide red tides um, that have ever occurred in Southern California. Um, so this um, was a beautiful, brilliant show of nature um, with this beautiful blue bioluminescence that happened and was visible at night. Um, however, it did cause massive problems for the ecosystem um, when there was a massive drawdown of oxygen. And so um, a lot of scientists at Scripps had centers all across San Diego County, um, and they were measuring ocean and um, estuarine oxygen conditions. And we all saw very, very low levels of oxygen that had a really, that likely had a very big effect um, on the ecosystem. Okay, so one of the main things that I would like to uh, remind everybody about ocean deoxygenation is that deoxygenation is not evenly distributed across the world. So we saw that nice figure that said a 2% overall decline. However, um, regionally, these oxygen losses can be much, much larger. Um, so for example, um, this figure is showing some of the examples of places um, where oxygen loss is much greater than the general 2%. So for example, in Monterey Bay, um, they've they've seen about a 40% decline in oxygen from 1998 to 2013 um, in kind of midwater depths. Here in Southern California, we've seen um, over a 20% decline in oxygen between the 80s and early 2000s. Um, the Southern Ocean has seen about a 16% decline in global oxygen loss. And the tropics and subtropics of the Pacific Ocean have seen millions of square kilometers of um, an increase in low oxygen water. Um, and so some of the areas that are um, most greatly affected are called eastern boundary upwelling systems. And so again, I'm showing this figure where you can see oxygen at 300 meters depth. This is showing some of the really, really low oxygen areas of the world where this low oxygen occurs naturally. And what really um, what is um, unique about these upwelling systems is that they rely on essentially um, wind-driven surface um, currents and the earth's rotation and essentially what that does is pushes water um, away from kind of uh, the, the coastline. And then so in order to replace that water, you get upwelling from very deep areas of the ocean and this upwelled water has, um, is very cold, it has very low oxygen, very low pH, but it has very, very high levels of nutrients. And so this actually supports these excessively productive ecosystems and also some of the big, world's biggest fisheries. Um, and so the kind of the four main eastern boundary upwelling systems are um, the California current ecosystem or the California current system, um, the Humboldt current system, the Canary system, and then the Benguela upwelling system. 
So these are areas in the world where um, deoxygenation is happening at a much faster rate, and they are definitely of concern for scientists. Deoxygenation is affecting um, nearly all biogeochemical and biological processes in the ocean. Um, and so we see that uh, a decrease in oxygen has affected the structure both of organisms themselves, such as um, body size, but also kind of um, the structure of communities. So taxonomic composition, so what species are available, um, biodiversity, and also the distributions of marine organisms. Um, Deoxygenation has affected animal function, so just the raw physiology of the organisms and how low oxygen affects their system, as well as kind of production and respiration um, in a larger sense, food webs, carbon burial, um, recruitment of fish to fisheries, as well as foraging behavior of marine organisms. And then on a large scale um, that actually touches us humans is we see these um, changes in ecosystem services as a result of deoxygenation. So we see changes in availability of fish and fish abundances for our fisheries that we rely on for protein. Um, and we also see changes to areas, um, you know, for example, in the red tide, changes recreation and tourism um, in marine areas all around the world. Um, but let's focus on some of the effects on the marine organisms themselves. Um, so how do we actually measure oxygen sensitivity in marine animals? Or what does oxygen sensitivity actually mean? So if we think of some hypothetical marine organism um, and living in some environment with a range of oxygen conditions, so um, think about oxygen is higher on the right end of this figure and um, lower on the left side of this figure. Um, so this blue box is essentially showing kind of the habitable oxy oxygen environment that this organism has. And so over some range of oxygen conditions, the organism is going to be able to survive and function and maintain a normal metabolic rate that allows it to carry out all of its tasks that it needs to do. So feeding, um, avoiding predators, swimming around, finding a mate, um, and everything like that. Um, and so as oxygen decreases within kind of this, this um, range of oxygen this animal can tolerate, the organism's physiology is going to be able to compensate for any change in environmental oxygen. Um, so even if the external environment oxygen is changing, the animal can kind of regulate its internal oxygen. And it does this through a variety of physiological adjustments, and that um, means kind of blood chemistry, um, change in heart rate, change in ventilation or breathing um, and other physiological changes. So um, a good example of this is if I go out for a run. Um, so I'm breathing fairly normally right now, my heart rate is resting, but if I start to go out for a run, my body is gonna physiologically adapt to the increased oxygen demand for my system. So my heart's gonna beat faster, I'm gonna breathe faster, um, and all of this is going to help me deliver more oxygen to my muscles where I need it. So marine organisms have very similar processes of adapting. And so theoretically over some range of oxygen, these animals are going to be fine and be able to sustain a normal metabolic rate. However, at some point, um, these marine organisms um, might experience oxygen levels um, externally that are, are too low for them to sustain their metabolic rate. And so we call this the peak crit, which is essentially the oxygen level where um, the organism's biological um, demand is not being met by su su the supply, so the external oxygen. Um, below this level, the animal is likely going to go into metabolic decline. Um, and then if this um, low oxygen persists, it might actually end up dying. Um, so, um, but this, this kind of peak crit is, is for the last 10 years has kind of been this physiological oxygen limit that scientists use to kind of determine oxygen vulnerability in marine organisms. Okay. So I've already kind of told you a little bit about how oxygen structures the marine environment and how organisms kind of move about the ocean um, in relation to oxygen conditions. So let's now start talking about how um, a further loss of oxygen is going to change how animals behave. So this figure on the left is showing um, small tiny boxes of color and these boxes essentially indicate the depth of the daytime diel vertical migration depth. 
Um, and so um, essentially these colors, warmer colors are indicating shallower depths, cooler colors are indicating deeper depths. And so um, all across the globe, this is showing essentially the maximum depth of these organisms in their vertical migration. And so one thing you might notice is that it looks a lot like this figure that I've shown you before um, a couple times now. And so um, one conclusion of this paper is essentially that oxygen is really responsible for driving the extent of vertical migration in animals all around the world. Because what we see is basically the extent of vertical migration is significantly limited um, in areas where there's a heavy oxygen minimum zone or there are very, very low um, kind of midwater oxygen levels. So with that said, so deoxygenation can actually lead to changing distributions of these marine organisms. Um, so keep the figure we just talked about kind of in context when I talk about these. So on the left, we have kind of a, um, a basically hypothetical um, ocean. And so the green area is kind of the warm surface layer um, and the blue area um, in the green area combined are kind of this aerobic habitat. So where there's plenty of oxygen for organisms to live. The purple area is considered the oxygen minimum zones. This is areas where there are really, really low oxygen conditions. Um, and then the pink and the blue are where oxygen starts decreasing um, again. And so right now, this dotted line is showing dial vertical migration. And what many organisms do is they essentially vertically migrate down to their oxygen limit and then they start coming back up. So their daytime distribution is just over the oxygen minimum zone. However, in a future ocean where we have kind of an expansion of these oxygen minimum zones, um, these, these marine organisms are going to have to do one of two things. So either they could do kind of similar to what we saw in the last figure where they'll change the extent of their vertical migration to still be above the kind of oxygen minimum zone layer in which case their habitat's going to shrink or they essentially keep their vertical migration at the same depth that they normally do but they're going to transit spend longer times in the oxygen minimum zone so areas where there's a really huge oxygen deficit for these animals and this is kind of a gamble for animals um, that are not not necessarily equipped for that um, and can cause a lot of problems. So um, one of the kind of impacts of deoxygenation is what we call habitat compression, which essentially means that these midwater oxygen minimum zones are, are kind of expanding and also the surface warm layer that animals might not be able to tolerate is kind of coming down from the top and it's kind of squishing their habitat um, to a smaller area of the surface ocean. Okay, so let's talk about some actual examples though. So this is one example in blue marlin. So scientists went out and tagged a bunch of blue marlin. Um, in this case, I believe this is off the, um, the east coast of Africa. And so um, this figure is showing depth on the y-axis um, over a period of time uh, from May to June. And the color scale is again showing oxygen. So these black Red values are very low oxygen conditions and the blue values um, are higher oxygen conditions. It's a little bit hard to see, but if you can pick out the yellow line in this figure, that's showing the depth of the marlin's vertical distribution um, and basically showing what areas of the water column the tuna, or sorry, the marlin is hanging out in. So what I want you to grab from this figure is that you can see the yellow line pretty much stays above the two milliliter per liter oxygen level. And so that basically is a hard oxygen limit for this blue marlin, and they're going to change their distribution based on the oxygen conditions available to them. So if you notice when the oxygen is higher um, because they changed location in June, um, they can now swim quite a bit deeper because they're not as limited by oxygen. So this doesn't just happen for pelagic vertically migrating organisms though. So here's an example from Southern California um, for a benthic organism. So these are two species of urchins, Lidocinus pictus and Strongulocentrotus fragilis, and shown in pink and blue here. Um, and this is an example diagram of the California coast. Um, and so um, over a period of 10 years, scientists looked at the distribution of these urchins and what they found was is at the end of the 10 years, they found that the distribution for S. fragilis had increased quite a bit, while the distribution for L. pictus had decreased. So one species saw habitat expansion because of changing oxygen conditions, and one species saw a change, um, a habitat reduction because of low oxygen. Um, so 
This is happening in all different types of organisms um, that are kind of changing their distributions according to oxygen levels. Um, so what we also see is that oxygen can drive abundance and diversity in marine organisms um, in the marine environment. And so here on this figure, we see um, depth again decreasing as you go down on the axis. And then you also see um, temperature changing in red and then oxygen changing in purple. And so um, what these authors did was, um, or these scientists did, was basically conduct net toes at very specific depth bins. And so after they take the nets out and they are starting to collect and count the animals, um, they took these pictures, which are really good photographic evidence of what's happening in the water column. Um, so at the surface, up in this mixed layer, which is, you know, from surface to 20 meters depth, um, what you can see is these, these sieves are really, really full of animals, all different types of animals, and there are a lot of them. So essentially really high abundance and pretty good diversity. However, when you go down to the oxygen minimum zone, the toes in the oxygen minimum zone had significantly less organisms, as well as kind of a, um, a different types of organisms that live there. And then when you go kind of in the suboxycline layer, as they defined it, which is in higher oxygen values, again, you can see some larger organisms, you can see some different um, abundance levels than you saw in the previous layers. So essentially, this is a good way of good visual representation of how oxygen is changing kind of the ecosystem structure um, of this area. So this was actually a study conducted off the coast of Costa Rica. Um, Okay, and um, I kind of want to wrap up this section with um, by discussing how tolerance to low um, tolerance to low oxygen is very very species specific. So when scientists first started looking at the effects of low oxygen on marine organisms, we kind of blanket um, kind of grouped these these organisms and these taxa um, that we thought would react the same way. Um, but the kind of current research has shown that it's entirely species specific. So not all fish are acting the same way. Not all crustaceans are acting the same way. Um, and this is really, really important for kind of species management and as well as kind of conducting science responsibly in the future. Um, and so here's an example on the left. Um, I'm showing an example of two fish that are really, really tolerant to low oxygen. So these two fish, the cusk eel and the cat shark, are found in areas where there's incredibly low oxygen, much lower than, we, than scientists actually thought fish would live in. Because um, normally we think of fish as requiring quite a bit of oxygen. Um, and so these areas, um, are, I'm sorry, these fish are found in um, the the Gulf of California in, um, in Mexico, and they um, are found in very, very low oxygen conditions naturally, and that's where they have very high abundance in these areas. Another um, high toler highly tolerant examples are um, the tuna crabs, so this pelagic red crab that you probably have seen washed up on the beach um, over the last few years. Um, and a highly sensitive example is a California current krill. So this nematocellus difficilis um, is, is pretty sensitive to low oxygen. And so what we see is that um, a few points from this, just that you can't um, necessarily kind of group marine organisms into, into um, big, put them in big boxes of oxygen sensitivity over whether they'll be sensitive or not, because it really depends on the species. Um, and the second point I want to uh, bring across from all of this research is um, that very, very tiny oxygen differences matter to organisms. And so even the tiniest change in oxygen can make a really big difference over whether you'll see an animal or you won't. Um, and so these animals are highly evolved to live in these um, either really low or really high or somewhere in between oxygen levels. Um, and any change in oxygen is going to be really have some catastrophic changes um, for a lot of different species. I started getting into this um, a, a couple of years ago, but um, after doing some reading, I realized that vision has incredibly high oxygen requirements. And this is primarily due to the fact that aerobic metabolism or oxygen is the fuel for these visual cells that we have in our eyes. And, and this is true for marine organisms as well. Um, and so 
the effects of oxygen on vision and visual function has been very well described in terrestrial vertebrates, but not so well in marine organisms, despite kind of the high oxygen variability they have in the marine environment. Um, so if I, as a human, were to decide to go fly a plane and I was to go up to very high altitudes, um, if I didn't supplement my cabin with oxygen, I would start to experience changes in night vision and in color vision, and I would have this pretty intense visual impairment just because I'm not getting enough oxygen into my system. Um, and so we don't really know that much about how low oxygen impacts marine organisms, um, but I kind of, we kind of um, guess that it's going to affect animals with fast vision um, the most. And so in the marine environment, these are really um, crustaceans like crabs and krill, cephalopods like octopus, squid, and cuttlefish, and marine fish. Um, these organisms are have really high oxygen requirements anyway. They're kind of fast-moving predators. Um, they live very active lifestyles, but they also have incredibly complex and well-developed visual systems that also theoretically would require a lot of oxygen. Um, and they rely on vision for a lot of their kind of biological processes. So finding food, avoiding predators, finding mates, um, looking at light for this migration cue. Um, and my research actually centers mostly around marine larvae or kind of early life stages of these marine organisms. Um, and I focus uh, right here um, in the California current right off of Scripps. Um, in this environment, oxygen and light both vary on diel or daily, seasonal, and interannual, so kind of multi-year timescales. Um, and these larvae vertically migrate from about 50 meters depth up to the surface. They also, similar to their adult counterparts, rely on vision for prey capture, predator avoidance, and light is their migration cue. And so um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of these effects in the California market squid, the two-spot octopus, the tuna crab, and also a brachyurin crab, a graceful rock crab. So my research primarily focuses on the effects of two stressors, oxygen and light on marine organisms, and then looking at kind of what happens to animals' phys visual physiology, metabolic physiology, visual behavior, and then the visual ecology of these organisms. And today I'm just gonna kind of bring out some highlights um, and just talk about a few things. So how do I actually measure vision in marine organisms? Um, um, I, we use a method called electrophysiology, which essentially measures the summed electrical responses of photoreceptors or these visual cells in the eye. So this is basically an electroretinogram or ERG. Um, this sounds very confusing, but if you've ever had a heart stress test, um, you've got an electrocardiogram. So essentially what they do is they stick electrodes to your chest and they're measuring essentially the electrical activity of cells in your heart. And so whenever your heart beats um, and squeezes, it, you show a little peak on the electrocardiogram. So essentially what I'm doing is the exact same thing. Um, I stick an electrode in the eye of these organisms um, and then I expose them to a light stimulus or a light flash and measure their response to it. Um, so here, um, this black bar is showing basically the light flash, and you can see um, a very large spike in the visual response. And so basically what I can do is look at the magnitude of this visual response as a proxy for how well these organisms might be able to detect this light. Okay, so now how do I actually change the oxygen conditions? So um, um, in this figure, um, you can see oxygen values on the left, um, also shown in this thick black line. And so throughout the experiment, which is shown kind of the entire experiment um, across time on the x-axis here, um, you can see this black line, it kind of, um, I keep the animals at a very high oxygen level, and then I start decreasing the oxygen level. I hold them at some low oxygen for a good amount of time, and then I start re-oxygenating the solution. All while I'm doing this, the animal is alive and I'm measuring their visual response to flashes of light, which is shown in this colored traces um, in these green dots here for the squid. Um, and so what you can see is that low oxygen causes a big decrease in visual function. Um, and we see this in all of the species that I tested. Um, and so um, 
you can see a few um, very sensitive species. So for the market squid, for the octopus, and for the rock crab, you, um, you can see that the visual response goes almost down to zero when they're in very, very low oxygen conditions. So what this essentially means is that these animals are functionally blind and they're not able to respond to light um, at all when they're at these low oxygen conditions. The good news is, is that when I reoxygenate the solution, they get their visual response back. So it does seem that for very acute or short-term oxygen exposures, these animals are actually able to regain visual function, which is great. Um, so um, we did see that uh, one species, this tuna crab, was not as sensitive to low oxygen. Its visual response did change when I decreased the oxygen, but not by that much. So you can see that species is a little bit more tolerant. To quantify this I and compare across species, um, I looked at essentially the oxygen level at which there would be 90% visual function, where there would be 50% visual function, and where there would be 10% visual function, which you can see in each of these little um, uh, bars here. Um, and so this allows me to compare across species because I'm essentially comparing at what oxygen levels their visual response starts decreasing. Um, and so again, this allows me to see that the market squid and the graceful rock crab are very sensitive to low oxygen, and the two spot octopus and the tuna crab are not as sensitive. How do I actually know that the animal isn't just going into meta metabolic decline, though? So I can measure um, the respiration rate of these organisms. So what I do is I actually put these tiny little marine or larvae in these small glass chambers, and I seal up the chamber, and then essentially I wait and wait while they suck up oxygen and they're doing their normal respiration, and this allows me to measure their oxygen consumption. The goal for this is to actually calculate this P crit, this metabolic metric that I was telling you about, where essentially um, the the animal is after below at oxygen lower than the P crit, the animal is no longer able to um, sustain its metabolic rate and it starts going into metabolic decline. So what was pretty cool was that I found that vision loss occurs at much higher oxygen um, conditions than P crit. Um, so for this metabolic metric. So for each of these figures, you have um, oxygen on the y-axis and um, for each of these metrics. So for uh, where there's 90% visual function, where there's 50% visual function, and where there's 10% visual function. So those are those two kind of three lighter colored bars in each of these figures. And I'm showing you this for the squid on the left and the octopus on the right. So what's cool is that if you look at where the P crit lies, it's at much lower oxygen conditions than where I see visual loss occurring. So what this tells me is that visual, um, by the time the organism reaches metabolic failure, the organism is probably already completely visually impaired or blind. Um, why am I so excited about about this? This is this is really interesting to me because scientists for a long time have kind of thought PCRIT is a really good metric for oxygen sensitivity and vulnerability in these species. However, um, if species that have really sensitive other processes that are really important for living, like eyesight or to other sensory systems, um, then their vulnerability is actually when those senses that are necessary start decreasing um, and not necessarily only when they start going into metabolic decline. So that's just something very important to keep in mind. Um, here's kind of just a really brief summary. So um, these, this is a comic made by Sasha Saroy. She's a very talented artist um, about uh, uh, some of my research. And um, essentially what this is showing is that ox baby octopus have really good eyesight in full oxygen conditions. However, when they go into areas of lower oxygen, they're going to have some sort of visual impairment. Um, and so this is kind of like, um, you know, why is this super important? Well, you know, I don't have great eyesight. Um, and so if I do not have my glasses on or my contacts in and I'm trying to walk around my apartment, I'll probably stub my toe or trip over something, um, all the things that are, have happened before while I'm trying to look for my glasses. Um, and so I'll still be able to get by, but I won't be able to necessarily um, be at the highest level of performance. And so these organisms really need their vision to survive. And so, with a marine organism, if they just miss a predator coming at them, they don't make it. 
So this is kind of a really high stakes thing for them. They really need their vision to function. Um, and so this can be really important um, kind of in a broader scale of things um, for these species and also for other highly visual species. There are things that every single person um, can do to help um, ocean deoxygenation, largely because anything you do that's going to help climate change is going to help ocean deoxygenation. Um, and so this is a really wonderful figure about kind of where the future, um, where future countries and scientists need to go to kind of take um, action against reducing carbon dioxide emissions and changing climate change um, to a better trajectory. Um, and so it's kind of recommending a, a, um, a combination of mitigation, repairing, adapting, and protecting. Um, so when I first read this paper, I was you know, I was like, okay, this seems a lot like something we could do with policy. And um, a lot of countries are working on really, really fabulous policy to reduce climate change or to reduce carbon emissions. But what can you actually do as a one single human? Um, so I broke down a couple of really easy suggestions for each category. Um, so for mitigation, you can carpool. Um, you can commute by bike to the grocery store or to work. Um, you can reduce your fertilizer use on your lawn or in your garden, um, and this will all kind of help. Um, for repair, you can plant native species or pollinator-friendly plants in your garden or your yard. Um, you can kind of join in in beach cleanups. Um, and also for adaptation, you can um, you can participate in smart buying. So if you are able, you can kind of make some choices about the food you eat um, and where you buy it from. So you can look at more sustainable options or options that are organic. Um, you can recycle and be trash mindful about how much plastic you're producing um, and whether you can reuse things instead of just throwing them away. You can use green energy sources. Um, and to protect, you can stand up for the environment. Um, be educated about your local legislation. Um, here in San Diego, we've had some different legislation passed recently about um, changes to habitat restoration for natural marshes that used to occur in Mission Bay. So kind of try to get involved with that. Um, you can reach around to different, um, you know, great, great um, kind of um, places like the Birch Aquarium and see if there's any citizen science options you can get involved in. Um, all of these things are going to make a difference. Um, and I attended a really cool lecture the other day about essentially um, looking at how the political climate was affecting um, or how the political climate and the environmental climate were kind of um, interacting at the moment. Um, and uh, with Justin Worland, who is a, a writer for Time Magazine, um, and one thing he mentioned really stuck out to me. Um, he had been talking that he was looking at a whole bunch of um, kind of carbon policy um, options for countries to look at kind of what the best thing they can do for kind of carbon mitigation is. And he came up with some, some best policies, but also his main conclusion from this analysis was just do something. Anything at this point is better than nothing. So I highly suggest everybody just do something. Start with one thing a day and that will truly make a difference. Um, and third, well, thank you.